Good morning, everyone. It is good to see your faces and good to picture some of you that I know always tune in online. You are in our hearts and we're glad you're here today. This morning as we get started, I'd like to start with kind of a little, kind of a game. I'm going to say a short phrase and you think, see, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when I say it, okay? So the phrase is, heads up. What is the first thing that comes to your mind if you hear someone tell you, heads up? Turn to someone beside you, in front of you, in back of you, and just let them know what's the first word, idea, phrase that comes to your mind when you hear, heads up. If you don't know anyone, make a friend. It's okay, be brave. <laughs> what comes to your mind? Okay, so there could be a few different situations, maybe something going on with work, maybe something with family, maybe a situation that you weren't, something you weren't expecting, right? I think, I think of sport references probably immediately, right? Heads up or, or hands up. I think of hearing um, my very, very short-lived basketball career, don't ask anything about it, tiny academy in high school and just jumped in because I could kind of shoot but not dribble and the coach was nice. Anyways, I remember hearing the phrase, hands up, ladies, right? Because the ball is coming and you want to make sure you're ready when it comes and you don't want to miss it. We've all been in those situations, right? Whether you're there or you're watching someone else and you're like, oh, heads up, you guys. It's like, it's there, look alive, wake up, heads up. Are you ready? This morning, we're going to look at a story of someone that didn't get that heads up. They didn't have someone tell them, but they were still ready. Let's pray one more time. Dear Father, God, thank you so much for being who you are. We worship you, we celebrate you today. God, help us hear your heart. Speak your word by your spirit right where we need it, God, and move us and change us and call us deeper into you. In your name, amen. This morning I'll be in the book of Genesis. If you have a Bible, you can start to turn there. You can look at the one in the pew in front of you. Before I tell you the chapter, I just want to paint a picture of our story this morning. A long, long time ago, somewhere far, far away, the day was starting to go by. The sun had been really high and hot in the sky, but now it was dipping lower and lower and lower. It was getting closer to that time of evening, and it wasn't quite as hot. We can picture that here in Florida, right? And so if you looked out over the village, you could see it's cooling down, and you could see different houses, and coming out of the houses were all the women of the town. And they all came out and you could see something on their shoulders. They were all carrying big water jars. And they all started to go down towards one place. See, during this time, if you needed water for your family or you were thirsty, you needed a drink, you couldn't just go grab a water bottle. You couldn't turn on your faucet or the tap. You couldn't push a button on your refrigerator. You had to walk far, maybe half a mile, maybe a mile, go down, and as in the case of this story, walk down some steps into the spring, get your jug, fill it with water, hopefully enough to last you a good while, and take the trek all the way home, hopefully without spilling any, right? So in our story today, all the women are coming out and they're doing this. That was their custom. But one girl seemed to kind of be in front. Maybe she was in a rush that day. Maybe her family really needed water to make dinner. She's got her jug. She goes down. She gets all the way down. She fills it with water. She hoists it to her shoulder. It's probably heavy. She goes up the stairs. She's just heading back, ready for whatever she's going to do next. And she hears a voice. Excuse me. Excuse me. Could I get some water? Oh. She turns around, she sees someone, he's, he's dressed all right, but he is covered in dust. He looks like he's been traveling for a long time. He probably hasn't had water in hours and hours, and he is thirsty. And we pick up this story in Genesis chapter 24. If you are using the Pew Bible, it's on page 16, and you can follow along with us. We are going to be reading verse 18. Genesis 24 
verse 18, give you a second to turn there. The girl hears this request, verse 17, please give me a little water from your jar. And she says, verse 18, drink my Lord, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. Now that last verse 21 clues us in that there's a little bit more going on in this story. And if you read the whole chapter, we find out that this traveler isn't just any traveler. This is the most trusted servant of a guy named Abraham. If you haven't heard of Abraham, he's very famous in the Bible. Basically, one day God told him, Abraham, I want to bless you, and I want to give you an amazing family, and through your family, I'm going to bless the world. And so Abraham goes, and God tells him to go to this new place, and he finally has a child, and his son grows up. His name is Isaac. And by this point in this story, Abraham is getting older. He only has a few more years probably left on this earth, a few more days, and he's starting to get a little bit nervous about his son, as I see some of you grandparents do this, right? Some of you parents. And he's like, Isaac, have you met anyone lately? Isaac's like, no, dad, just leave me alone, it's fine. And he's like, Isaac, I'm telling you, you need to look around, you need to find someone, you know, farther on in life, it'll be harder, whatever he says. But poor Isaac, I mean, he's been going around, he's been visiting people, he's been doing the things, maybe he got on Avenus contact, maybe he even ventured on Bumble, you know, cautiously, who's in the area, there is no one. And Isaac's having a tough time, and so his dad is worried. And before he dies, he wants to make sure God has given his family this promise. He wants to make sure that Isaac finds someone good to carry on this family. So he calls his servant in and he says, my friend Eliezer, that was his name, Eliezer, please, you must promise me that you're going to find a wife for my son. And Eliezer was either crazy or he really cared about Abraham because he said, I'll do it. I'm your man, I'll go. So he packs up, he takes everything, Abraham's wealthy, he takes 10 camels with him, loads them down, and he makes a trip. And as he's getting closer to where the place, Abraham's homeland, where he told him to go to look for a wife for his son, I can only imagine the pressure that this servant is feeling. He has to find someone for his master's son, someone who's a good person, someone who loves God, someone that hopefully he, li that he will like. That's a lot. That's serious matchmaking. And I can only imagine how he must be, have been praying throughout that whole trip. And when he gets there, as he arrives at the spring, he prays this very bold prayer. And we can see the prayer in verse 12. He has this idea, I'm gonna go to the spring right as all the women are coming out and I'm gonna ask God something. Genesis 24, verse 12. Then he prayed, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, see, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. What a prayer. He believes that God is just going to send someone at that time, and God does, because verse 15, before he had finished praying, here comes our girl, here comes Rebecca. And she comes up, he asks her the question, can I have a drink? She says yes, she follows the script. And the rest of the story goes by, and if you read the whole thing, he meets her family, it's a whole beautiful thing, she agrees to go back with him, they travel back to meet Isaac, and they get in the neighborhood right as Isaac is out praying in the field. And they fall in love and live happily ever after. That's the way we usually hear it. But I want to focus on a little more in this story because I think there's so much going on here. And I'd like to look at Rebecca. Because Rebecca didn't know who this guy was. 
She had no idea that he was the servant of Abraham. She had no idea that this was going to culminate in her meeting someone and moving away and all these things. All Rebecca knew was that she had a task to do, she needed to get her water, she needed to go home, and someone's here that she doesn't know that's maybe interrupting her plans. We've all been there, right? Maybe you have a quick thing to get at Publix and you go in there and you're like, please nobody talk to me. I'm just gonna hide back in this aisle. Some of you are not like that. You're like, hi, hi. And then the rest of you are like, I avoid you. But (laughs) we've all been there when we're in a rush and we don't have the time. But Rebecca doesn't care who this person is. She values this stranger. And she says, sure, let me get you a drink. Hospitality of the time would have probably dictated as much. Yeah, I can let down my jar and give you a drink. And then that's probably enough. You can go back to your house. But Rebecca looks and she sees not one camel, not two camels, not even five camels, 10 camels. If you know anything about camels, the little bit that I know is that camels can go a very long time without drinking. And that is a special gift. I am not a camel. However, the problem is that when they stop to drink, they have to drink a lot because maybe it'll be a few weeks till they do it again. So she looks and she sees the camels. Maybe a good time to say, oh, I didn't see that. I'm gonna keep it moving. But Rebecca quickly says, oh, I'll draw water for your camels too. A sip, no, I'll draw water for your camels until they have finished drinking. How long is that going to take? Well, if you look into it, camels can drink a lot. 10 camels might have drunk up to about 250 or 400 gallons of water. So I don't know how many gallons of water fit in her jug. Let's say maybe it was really big, maybe it was five gallons. Can you imagine how many times, how many trips she would have had to go down into the spring? It says down, right? Get it, come back up, empty it in there and go back. And the Bible says that she quickly does this and she runs. She's just going. She doesn't know who this guy is, but she's trying to welcome him and make him feel at home. Because Rebecca was ready to welcome this person, to show him hospitality. She got to be part of God's story. God is sending us people all the time. And this story really makes me think of a verse in the New Testament that I think Rebecca epitomizes. If you would open up and turn a little farther down in Hebrews chapter two. In Hebrews chapter two, sorry, Hebrews 13 in verse two. I moved my marker. It's toward the end, towards Revelation. All right. In Hebrews 13, 2, Paul tells us, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. This is a classic verse, but if you look a little bit deeper into this passage, that part, do not forget to entertain strangers, do not forget to show hospitality. The original language, the Greek, that word for hospitality, we'll put it up next, is actually philozenia. I think it's coming up right next, there it is. And that is two words joined together. It comes from philo, which is like a dearly loved friend someone you really care about, not just any random acquaintance, someone that you love, and xenos, stranger. So when you put those two words together, we find that the word hospitality in the Bible really means the love of strangers. How do you feel about that definition? Does anyone feel a little bit uncomfortable, right? We grow up stranger danger, maybe don't talk to strangers, kids that is still good counsel, all of us. But in the Bible, hospitality is the love of strangers. In the heart of God, there is a love for strangers. God values all of us, right? None of us are strangers to him. But even in the Old Testament, lately as I've been reading through Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, again and again when God is talking to his people, he says, don't forget about the alien. Don't forget about the stranger. Don't forget about the refugee, the immigrant. Don't forget about those people because I want you to include them too. I want them to be part of my family. This is how God operates. 
Again, in the book of Matthew, Jesus epitomizes this in his whole life. In Matthew chapter five, if you wanna turn there, we find the Sermon on the Mount. And right in the middle of it, Jesus says, asks this question. Matthew five, verse 47. And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even Gentiles do that? Jesus says, if you go around greeting your friends, the people that you know, you think you're special? Everybody does that. Doesn't matter where you're from. We oftentimes think of hospitality as maybe someone in our friend circle that just has a beautiful home. It's always clean, miraculously. You come there, the food is beautiful. It's just a special gift. I'm looking at some of you that have this gift and it's amazing. But when you go there, if you're the one going there with them, that's not technically hospitality. If I'm opening up my home to my friends, that's a beautiful thing. That's very biblical and scriptural. But according to the Bible, Hospitality is love for a stranger. Jesus is pushing us beyond our usual accepted limits, right, of what it means to follow him, because Jesus is always bigger. And when I think about these passages, I started to think of something that happened years ago when I think about the people that God sends us and how God calls us to live in this world. When I was about eight or nine years old, I lived up in Tennessee with my family, and my dad has this nonprofit ministry, and so he would have different people come together and have like a training. And we'd have people come in from different places in the United States, wherever. But one day, this training was coming up, and my dad gathered us together, all his siblings, and he said, we have some special people coming. And we went, oh, who's coming, dad, who's coming? And he said, there's a pastor that called me from Rwanda. And he loves Jesus. He doesn't go to the same church as us. He goes to another church, but he really loves Jesus and his team. And they want to really be with us and see how we can invest more in discipling our children. The country of Rwanda has been through so many hard things. And he said, I want to really just help these kids know how much Jesus loves them. And so my dad said, they're going to come stay with us. And so we went, oh, okay. So of course we had to start cleaning and we had to vacuum the floor and we had to sweep and we had to clean up our rooms and all the things that we had to do because they were gonna stay there. And then after that, my siblings and I went outside and some of you have done this and we got the chalk and we started making all these pictures for them to see and oh, of a sun and a tree and welcome with all the colors and oh, it's so beautiful, rainbow. And we're there and we come up to the day And we wait, and we don't see them. We wait a few more hours, and they don't come. We wait a few more hours, and they're still not there. And finally, my dad gets a call. He talks on the phone a little bit, and then he gathers us together, and he says, hey, kids, something happened. Our special friends won't be coming. We went, what? Why not? Well, some tensions from what happened years ago in the 90s have kind of resurfaced in this area. And so this pastor, all of his church members have had to flee into the forest. And so the pastor can't come because he's going into the forest to go look for them. Can you imagine? To this day, I still don't know what happened to this special group. And I pray and I hope that they're okay. But in that moment as kids hearing, they're not going to come, we couldn't understand all the reasons why. But all we knew is that our special friends that we had been heard so much about, they weren't going to have our mom's homemade bread, they weren't going to be able to stay in our house, all of our chalk drawings, they weren't going to see them. And we had to just be there by ourselves. We were crushed. And I look back and I think we actually cried because we were so ready. My dad had built this up. And I look back at that, and I think of how I was, and I have to ask myself, how am I? God is sending us people all the time, but if they don't come, do I miss them? Do I even notice that they didn't make it? Am I crushed that they didn't come? And if God does send me someone, like he always does, because God is always sending us people, am I actually ready? Am I ready to receive them? Why is it so important for us to be ready? 
I'm going to need some help. I'm going to do a quick illustration, and I think I'm going to come down here, and I need two people. Could be anybody. Could be two kids. Could be teenagers, adults, whoever is brave. All you're going to have to do is walk through something. It won't be that hard. I see one. I see another one. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let's give them a hand. Okay. So I need one of you, you can turn around, tell us your names. Jasmine. Jasmine and? Kennedy. And Kennedy. Okay, I need one of you to represent our church family. Okay, so you're, okay, so you're gonna be our church family, awesome. Kennedy, you are gonna be someone new, okay? So I want you to imagine that you've never been to this church before, okay, you've never been here. So I want you to go stand right over here. Okay, Jasmine, you're going to stand right here. Now, when someone comes here for the first time, do you think it's easy for them to come to this church? God is sending us people, but you know the enemy has a plan, right? Because he wants to throw everything in their way that will make it hard for them to come in these doors. So Kennedy, I'm just making a general situation, okay? This is not true for you. This is just like for some random person. You're going to pretend to be that, okay? So someone coming to our church, what are some of the roadblocks that might keep them from coming in? You can say them out loud if you want. Yeah, that's a big one. That they might say, Kennedy might say, I don't know anybody there. I don't, I don't know if, if they'll be nice. I don't have anyone to go with. There's nobody I know. That's a pretty big roadblock, right? That's pretty scary. What else? Yeah, they might, uh, might be sick, might be tired, might have had a long week, might be dealing with some really hard things in their life, right? Any hard thing that makes it feel like, I don't think I can handle going to church. What else? What else could keep someone from coming? Ooh, we'll get to that one. That's a good one. Maybe Kennedy doesn't know what to wear, right? That's a beautiful dress. But typically, most people don't wear this every day. You might be saying, oh my goodness, what if, I, what if I wear the wrong thing? You know, what if people look at me funny? Maybe, here's a big one, maybe there's some past experiences, some painful things that have happened with church, or with people who say they love God, or with family who says they love God, maybe even with a pastor, mercy. It's a pretty big one. I'm gonna use that cone for that. That could be a big roadblock. It could be any number of things, right? Maybe insecurities, maybe saying, I don't don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if they'll like me. Maybe they'll judge me. Maybe I'll come in and I won't feel like I belong. And as I'm putting these out here, we've probably all felt these at some time or other, right? When coming to church, we've probably all felt these. We can all relate to them in different ways. And so when God sends us somebody, that person, in order to walk through, has to be incredibly brave. Kennedy, will you be able to walk through it? Will you be brave? Okay, wow. And when they come on the other side, Jasmine, imagine us as a church, and you can turn around and face this way, yes, sweet. Um, As we as a church, when that person comes all the way through, what do we do? Yes, she said we greet them. Imagine if Kennedy came all the way through and she walked over all that and did all those hard things and we didn't even notice as she came. We didn't even say hi to her. Wow, that wouldn't be fair, would it? Or what if we just kind of saw her and we're like, oh, that's kind of funny, you're wearing something different, you sound different than I was expecting you to sound. No, Kennedy, you went through all that and God sent us to us. God sent you to us and we are so excited. So what would you do to greet her? You show us. How can you greet her? You'll show her every place around the church. Okay, can you, what do you think? You might give her a handshake, a high five, a hug. Would you do one of those? Beautiful, very good. Okay, good job, ladies. Thank you so much. Go back to your seats. Let's give them a hand. They did awesome. So it's, it's kind of fun, but it is serious, right? This and this moves my heart so much, and it breaks my heart when someone goes all the way through, and then maybe they go back and they're not, right? And I love what Jasmine said. We're going to greet them with all that we are because we want you to know that you belong. So how can we make this practical for us as a church today? Some of us maybe already do this, but I think God can push all of us deeper. 
I've heard so many beautiful stories in this church and testimonies right here in this baptistry of people who have said, wow, you know, I came to this church, my friend invited me, or my Sabbath school, and they just made me right at home, right? And because of that, I've seen Jesus and, and he's changed my life, and I love those stories. But you know what? I want to hear so many more of those stories. And I know that God has so many people right around us that he wants to send us. Are we ready? So how can we be ready? Two practical things. Here's our challenge, my challenge to myself that I'll share with you this week. Number one, remember what hospitality means? Love of strangers. Number one, this week, pray, Jesus, give me a love for strangers. Jesus changed the way that I see people, that I actively, I see them and I reach out and I love them. And that's not something we can't all reach everybody right, but if we all do that, imagine what God can do for just one person. And that prayer is one that God will always answer. It's his will and he lives inside of us. So number one, pray for that love of strangers. Number two, practical, you can start practicing it even today. It's called the rule of three, the circle of 10. So what did I say, the rule of? Three, the circle of 10. So the first three minutes after this service ends, before you go, before you say hi to all your friends, you look at 10 people around you, okay? So look at 10 people around you, you can even practice it right now, and you ask yourself, do I know all of their names? Do I know all of them? Chances are, in a church this big, you probably don't know all of them, right? You probably don't know all their names. Maybe you've seen them before and you forgot their name. So the first three minutes after the service, after that, you can go, you can do whatever you wanna do, you can have your haystack, you can talk with your friends, but the first three minutes, save it for those 10 people. Greet them, tell them hi, tell them you're glad that they came, and introduce yourself. Maybe reintroduce yourself. <laughs> Some of you, this is gonna push you a lot because you're saying, I am really shy. Or, what if it's awkward? Ooh, we've all been there. I feel like I'm awkward here all the time. Or you might be saying, here's a big one. What if I've seen them before and I should know their name, but I don't remember it? Ooh, has anyone felt that way? That is a very real fear that I, fear, I feel every week. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I would rather look silly, I'd rather have someone repeat their name, I'd rather it be awkward than to miss someone that God is sending me. So how many of you would take me up on those challenges to pray that prayer and to practice the rule of three, the circle of 10? Would you do that with me? Imagine what Jesus would do, what he's already doing, what he would do more. Church, God is sending us people. Let's be ready. Let's pray. Dearest Jesus, I love your heart. Thank you for inviting me and all of us to be part of your family. Thank you for making us feel welcome, God, for making us feel at home. Thank you for this church family, Lord. I'm so grateful for this church. God, I pray that you would give us a love for strangers, <laughs> not in a weird way, in a you way, that when people would come in, they would know that your love is real. And I pray, God, that that would bubble out into every part of how we do Saturday here, but not just Saturday, how we live every day of our week. God, I pray this for the, through the power of your Holy Spirit, and I thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.